we're going to have to share this. Yeah. So, hello. I just pass the Bob Barker mic back and forth for the next 45 minutes. So, uh, my name is John Jacoby, and uh, I helped uh, David and some others start WordCamp Miami 10 years ago. <laughs> Woo! And so, uh, with 10 years of WordCamp Miami and WordPress turning 15 this year, right? Yeah. Uh, Matt was nice enough to stop by and, uh, and celebrate with us, which is uh, really great. So it's good to see you. And uh, I've, uh, yeah. And so we sort of have a weird tradition of not doing keynotes at WordCamp Miami. It's not. We don't have like a keynote flagship speaker. And I thought for 10 that I would like, oh, how can I help and do something special? And then when Matt said he was coming, this was the most special thing that I felt like we could do. Uh, we, Matt does a state of the word every year that is uh, lots of questions and answers, lots of time, lots of presentation slides, numbers, and everything. But uh, my style is generally a little bit more casual, with some fireside chat kind of stuff. And so, uh, I started with WordPress 10, 11, 12 years ago and helped Jeff uh, with WordPress Weekly on the weekly podcast for about the past year or so. And well, one of the things that we do uh, with newcomers on the podcast is talk about our uh, oh, WordPress origin story. And mine is, I'm like one of a dozen people who came in like the side door because I found BB Press before I found WordPress. Uh, I was looking for forum software that did a very specific type of thing and didn't know that WordPress existed. I found BB Press first. And, uh, and so, Matt, I'm curious, what is your WordPress origin story? <laughs> ah, it actually well, it goes back to comments on a blog post. Um, I had started blogging. I loved and still love uh, blogs. I think they're the most interesting and coolest thing on the internet. And uh, I was reading lots of blogs at the time. And so I thought, uh, how hard could this be? I'll start blogging myself. And went through a series of software, including movable type, and then B2, and text pattern, and what else was around at the time? Blogger. Um, so playing around with all of these, uh, like B2 the best, B2 developments had paused. So I left a blog post saying, hey, I wish something combined all the best elements of all this other software. And this fellow from the UK named Mike Little left a comment and said, hey, if you're serious about this, I'd love to work with you on it. And that was kind of the inception of WordPress. Uh, we started working together from across the Atlantic, myself in Houston, him someplace in the United Kingdom. I don't remember exactly the city. We'd never met and actually would not meet for several years to come. Uh, but we had this shared passion. We were both volunteers on the B2 forums. We both contributed code to B2. And so we just kind of knew each other through the internet and began hacking on it together. Uh, he had written a cool extension for B2 called B2 Links. And so he started to bring that in. I was very interested in making like the installation smoother because that was one of the sort of key uh, barriers identified in Google type, which was a lot harder to install and get going with. So I thought if we made that easy, that would be kind of good competitively. And we both just started coding and doing everything, like the support, the documentation, the code, the design, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, a little bit of everything. So that's how it got started. So how, how, I mean, that was 15 years ago. Where were you in your life? How old were you? What were you doing? Where were you working? What was it? Because I think that there, uh, we have a room full of developers, designers, people that are building stuff, inventing stuff, apps. Uh, startups, uh, servers under the desk. Uh, what was it like trying to come up with an idea and meet people online and patch all? Like we're, we work with GitHub now. It was SourceForge back then, right? Like, what was what was your day to day like trying to make WordPress into a thing? What was the, where did the name come from? Even like, where what was the history of it, it becoming what it is now? That was a lot of things. Uh, I'll talk about the name first. The name came from, there was a local blogger meetup. I think actually even using meetup.com, which was around even then. And uh, it was just folks who got together as bloggers. And I had been going since I was too young to get into the venues they would meet at. Um, do you all have a flying saucer here? 
like it's like a beer pizza place, I would go to Flying Saucer like, during the day when they weren't checking IDs and just stay there with my laptop <laughs> until, you know, they, later when the meetup was. <laughs> and um, so that was, yeah, at the meetup there is this uh, awesome woman, her name's Christine Chermule. She had a website called Big Pink Cookie, which was a pretty big and influential blog at the time. And um, yeah, she came up with the name WordPress. I think she was driving and she, we actually had cell phones I know, I feel so old. But she called me and she was like, I checked it, the .org is available, and that's where the name came from. At the time, I had graduated from the High School for the Performing Visual Arts and started attending U University of Houston, where I was studying political science, uh, because the computer courses I took there were really terrible. It was like visual basic type stuff. And um, the, my day was, you know, kind of ignoring my classes a little bit. <laughs> I spent a lot of time online and with my friends, just working on things. I derived about half my income uh, from saxophone, actually. So playing gigs around town, like big band gigs or different things. Uh, about 30% from building websites, often for the same musicians that I'd be playing gigs with. And uh, about 20% actually building computers. So like buying all the parts to like put together a computer which would be 10% cheaper than if you bought them from Dell or something like it. You'd kind of just assemble that, which I actually really enjoyed. And I kind of missed that. So uh, one of the things when, uh, when I lived in Miami and before we had WordCamp Central, uh, the first WordCamp was technically a bar camp here by Refresh Miami. So that's where the roots of WordCamp Miami are, is Refresh Miami. Uh, and my first full-time like WordPress gig uh, was for a company that was in Kendall. And so I would commute from where I lived to Kendall, and then I had side gigs, one that was in South Beach, and I was making the haul all over my South Florida to, to handle all these client gigs and projects and do all, all the legwork all over the place. And, uh, and when we had met on IRC and we had chatted online and we had known each other from patching and working on stuff, uh, but we didn't meet, I don't think in person until WordCamp Orlando in 2009, when the whole core team met for the first time. Mark, Peter, Andrew, Jen, and Brian, everybody. And, uh, and so uh, for the first few years of working on WordPress, once it had a name, once it had a home, once it was a thing, uh, talk about what it was like to build something and, and have users and, and, and how that happened. Because for me, it was in the forums, like you. It was WordPress.org forums. I can help with something. I don't like something. I can fix something. I can guide somebody. We can put you in a, around in a place. But uh, for you, you, what was that like, uh, building a community and seeing a vision for things and trying to see it through? Yeah, it's, it's a lot like it. It works today, actually. So instead of IRC, well, there's still IRC, but most people are in Slack now. <laughs> um, instead of many BB powered forums, and now BB press powered forums. And I think that the best way to, to get involved is just to dive in with something. And it could be anything. It could be reviews of plugins. It could be responding to reviews of plugins. It could be you know updating a patch and track. It could be you know almost any place that you could imagine that you can type something in a box and it goes on the internet associated with WordPress. That was basically how the rest of us all got started with it. Um, often the, the sort of genesis story of someone like a Ryan Bourne, who was a lead developer for many years, he just submitted so many patches that I got tired of dealing with them. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you do these yourself. And that was, uh, that was how it got started. Um, and it's also good to remember that you know, often these big things can start with a single step. So even though it might feel like you're doing something very, very small right now, um, it can blossom. Actually, I don't know if you know this. I was a co-founder of Barcamp. Really? Yeah. Um, the, there were about five of us, and it was because there was something that Tim O'Reilly did called Foo Camp, yeah. so for Friends of O'Reilly. And, um, and a bunch of us weren't invited to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're like, why don't we start our own and make it open to everyone versus being an invite-only thing, make it someone that anyone can go to, and then also make it not just can anyone go to it, but can this be replicated in a bunch of different cities all around the world? Um, so that was, uh, everyone happened to be, the, to get a little history on the story, I had driven out from San Francisco to Houston, uh, other way, Houston to San Francisco, 
uh, with my mom, who was very worried about me dropping out of school, and I think convinced I was going to starve. She really wanted me to work at uh, Google, not CNET, where I took the job, because purely because of the food, <laughs> not because of anything to do with Google. Um, so not working at a place of free food, she was very concerned. So she was kind of like uh, there for a few weeks, actually, and just mostly cooking things and putting them in my freezer <laughs> and labeling it and everything. And so at one point, she was like, hey, let me, uh, I'd love to cook for your friends. Like, why don't you invite them over for dinner, and we'll make some spaghetti and stuff. And uh, I didn't know how to tell my mom that I didn't really have any friends yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just moved to the city. So I was like, well, who do I know on the internet? Um, so some of those folks, uh, like, who later did interesting things as well, like Chris Messina, later invented the hashtag. Tontek Chelik was a core developer on Internet Explorer, now I think Mozilla. So they all came over for dinner. Om Malik is now one of my best friends. These are just people I knew on the internet or I answered support emails for or something. Um, they all came over. And uh, at that point, that's when we started talking about food camp, because none of us were there. I think it was like the Friday of food camp. And we're like, hey, what about bar, bar camp, food bar? Awesome. That's a great story. So uh, at that word camp, at word, or word camp Orlando, uh, it was interesting for me because I was giving a talk about buddy press communities. And in the front row of my talk, is you and Jen and Mark and Ryan and Andrew and Pete. The, all of the WordPress leads are in the front row of my talk while I'm talking about siloed buddy press communities at WordCamp Orlando. And your question to me, which I will forever remember, is what do we do about all of these accounts and all of these social networks and all of these, uh, these, these silos that we're going to have if we have 100,000 buddy press installs? Uh, what are you going to do with that? You're not going to have an account on every single social network all over the place. And my kind of off-the-cuff answer at the time was, you can't. You, like this was Diaspora was kind of distributed social networking was starting to be a thing. And in my imagination, the solution wasn't to distribute it. It was to centralize it. It was to take your ID and use Gravatar or use WordPress.org or have a site switcher or have a way to have an identity live in the middle and off to all these things, uh, which ends up kind of being Jetpack in a way. You have all these separate WordPress sites, may or may not have BuddyPress on them, connect them together, and now you're kind of good to go. And we have Gravatar, your face on things, and uh, we've kind of gone the other way around. Uh, and so uh, when I worked at Automatic for a little while on the social team, I got to work on Jetpack for a little bit. Um, but I'm curious what, like, obviously how Jetpack is going, but uh, your vision for Jetpack as you're implementing it and watching it grow and turn into things, uh, is it turning into what you wanted it to turn into way back in 2009 and 10 when we were kind of dreaming it out? Yeah, it's getting there. Um, I mean, I'm a big believer in decentralized systems. So if you ever see me work on something that's centralized, it's only because the technology isn't quite there yet to make it decentralized. <laughs> I would much prefer it to all be decentralized. And perhaps with things like, uh, well, how do we have the same identities across all these hundreds of thousands of websites on the web? Well, could we have a distributed database? Does that look like a ledger? Could something like blockchain? Yeah. So things are starting to come together that could afford, albeit right now in a very expensive way, a better implementation of these. But in the meantime, I want WordPress to be as successful and widely used as possible. So that's kind of the genesis of Jetpack. Like, what do we need to put in there that, for either philosophical or technical reasons, can't go in core? Like, let's say, integration with Facebook and Twitter, uh, stats, uh, an image CDN, because we need our sites to load in under five seconds on mobile. And it's not going to do that if your images aren't optimized for different device types and things like that. So. All of those things are what we decided to say, well, let's put kind of a single plugin and get it in as many of the WordPresses in the world. And we have stats that show, like, if a, if a brand new person starts with WordPress, if they have Jetpack installed, they are double-digit percentages more likely to keep using that site one month, six months, 12 months later. So there's things like this that show that it's working. Um, but there's still uh, a lot of miscommunication around Jetpack, just like there's a lot of miscommunication or misunderstanding about Gutenberg, almost everything in the WordPress world. <laughs> we obviously need to communicate better. Uh, 
Chris gave this great presentation. You listed 10 different ways to optimize your images, but not Photon and Jetpack. So like, there's obviously a lot that we need to do to get the message out there a bit better than it has been thus far. Um, so it includes a number of really free things that are great, including Photon, which uh, is an image CDN. So it takes all of your images, distributes them throughout 26 data centers all over the world. Uh, if you go to DNSperf, it is the fastest network, uh, neck and neck with Cloudflare. So basically something that normally you'd have to pay a lot more for. And um, then optimizes them on the fly for any device. So obviously devices have different pixel densities. They are different sizes, all these sorts of things. So it can create all that on the fly. Uh, if this were happening on your server, it would be very, 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 very expensive. But because we've built this kind of global network, I would say one of the things that Automatic's been most successful at is actually the systems. And building out these kind of network of data centers that can do massive processing at massive speeds, basically instantly all over the world. Um, we can now be competitive with like a Facebook or a Twitter or these other centralized networks. So it's kind of the best of both. You get complete control over the code and to run it wherever you like, but then you have a hybrid where you'll get some of these more centralized-like features, but without giving up any of the freedom or control that you have with installing it. I think this hybrid approach is actually going to be, in many ways, what I would like to be the future of web software. Um, because the technology is not quite there yet, um, or maybe the cost is too prohibitive, that even if you ran these things, like a video transcoder, uh, image CDN, um, or maybe the APIs don't allow it, like with centralized services, like uh, integrations with Facebook or Twitter, it would be almost prohibitive to get everyone to set all those different softwares up on their computer so, or on their server. So this is the in-between, and uh, I encourage everyone to check it out and install it. It has some JTRIP code somewhere in there. So, <laughs> so it reminds me a lot of uh, solar, solar energy. Like, there's a, you can, anyone can tack solar on the roof of their house. And that's good, because you get to do it, you get to own it, relatively speaking. It's sustainable, it's your solar. But at the same time, there are huge solar farms out in huge places, because they can generate solar more efficiently in a better place, with more square footage, and they can ship that solar out to everybody else. To me, it seems really natural to want to take the hard to process things, kind of hide them away, a little bit or offload that processing remotely so that it's out of sight. Nobody has to really worry about it. It is just a thing that gets fed back into you. And then there are it, people or individuals that philosophically want to own it. They want to do their own image crunching. They want to do their own everything. And for that, it is open source. You can run your own instance of Photon. The folks at Human Made forked it and have Tachyon. There are other instances and ways that we can kind of navigate this. It seems very natural to have one bigger way of doing it that offload that processing and then have one smaller way of doing it individually if it's something that you really wanted to do. And uh, one of the things that, the segue there is that one of the uh, phrases that you have used over the years that is kind of deeply ingrained in the WordPress community and the culture and the philosophy is the idea of democratizing publishing. And I think when I would first hear you say it years ago that I didn't really understand what that meant uh, until I was older and started getting more politically involved and, uh, and, and kind of was able to see what that vision was. And, uh, and recently had heard Elon, uh, in regards to SpaceX, talk about SpaceX democratizing space travel. And I thought, like, he's listening to WordPress stuff. <laughs> Like, Elon is getting democratizing space travel from WordPress and democratizing publishing. And, uh, and there are all these little isms that are like WordPress cultural things. Code is poetry. Democratizing publishing. Uh, that are like very WordPress specific. Um, and the word, the name WordPress to me is as good or better than like movable type. It's like really great. Uh, historically, the reference to Gutenberg, Gutenberg itself, like all the little hints and uh, respect that gets paid back to the you know, way that we got to publish, publishing on the web now uh, is really neat. Uh, but I'm curious, how, or like, how, is that imp how did that become an important part for you to, I mean, not, not just to pay homage to it, but to name Gutenberg Gutenberg is, I don't know, it's really 
uh, compassionate. I think it's really smart. I think it kind of proves a lot of things. So uh, I guess my question is, uh, is uh, kind of how, how did we, how does it get, how, did, how do you dream these things up or how do they flow out? Where does it come from? Well, like many of these things, they come from collaboration, right? The name WordPress itself, I didn't come up with. Someone else came up with it. Um, and that's, uh, I was talking to some students earlier, and um, at one point I tried to emphasize that, I'll emphasize to y'all, is that as a kind of a solo coder, you know, we have this vision of like the solo coder sitting in front of the laptop all by themselves. Um, but even from the early days of WordPress, that was people in front of their laptop talking to other people on their laptop. Everything that was great that we ever created came through lots of collaboration, lots of contribution. Um, I don't actually, I need to look up because I don't remember exactly how the name Gutenberg came about. But um, you can see it as a natural outgrowth of well, two things. One, like you said, this kind of like allusion to the, the printing press and kind of the ideas of publishing being an enabling force for both not just democracy, but just humanity, like how we connect with each other. Uh, but two, WordPress is always, I, I feel like, harkened back to the folks who came before us. You know, every release is named after a great jazz musician. Um, jazz, of course, being a music of improvisation and collaboration. <laughs> like, there's some solo jazz, but not that much, to be honest. Uh, it's really all about interaction between musicians. Uh, there's lots of references in the code, and even some of our obscure naming things. If you wonder why the wiki was called the Codex, <laughs> or the store is called Mercantile. Like, these are kind of references to things hundreds of years old sometimes. Um, and we want to... And I'm a big believer that we're not doing anything new, actually. Everything that we're trying to accomplish, I mean, some of it was talked about st by Stuart Brand in the late 80s. Or um, There's pioneers of computing and then pioneers of publishing. And then if you go back, pioneers of like what the technology of its day, like what does it mean to be able to construct arches and then create buildings from that? What happens when you put an organ in it, which was some of the most sophisticated technology of its time? when you can papyrus, like all of these things, we don't think of as technologists, but they actually really are technologies. Double ledger accounting. I love these things. Because <laughs> when you go back, we're going to look, back, hopefully, at some point, just like you said, the idea of democratizing has become kind of democratized. And it's now like a phrase that almost every startup puts in their thing. I'm glad Elon's using it, but like <laughs> the others, I don't know sometimes. But these ideas become, you don't even know it's so embedded in the culture and so part of the zeitgeist that you, you just feels like it was always there. And it gets hard to imagine the time before cell phones, like smartphones, like iPhone, right? Half of you are looking at them right now. <laughs> what did we do in talks? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we had laptops, actually. I, I didn't remember that. But they were offline. It was really frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The battery's dead, yeah. It was, um... Yeah. So, I have an idea for a plug-in. <laughs> Based on everything you just said. Uh, so, just like Gutenberg is a great name, and, uh, and I don't think that it's any, uh, it's any mistake that there are blocks that we're building with, because that's what movable type was. They were just blocks. They were letters. Some, some of them really elaborate designs and flourishes and everything, but they were just blocks. Um, Johannes Heidenberg uh, is credited as the uh, originator of cryptography. And so I have this idea, which I will give to y'all to build it because I haven't had time. This could easily be a jetpack thing too. So that is, uh, uh, I think it would be neat in a plugin like this to uh, insert zero width characters into post content with a hash to sign them. So if someone plagiarized your content, they wouldn't know it because they, you would see the zero length character in your paragraph. You would know it was your content because you would have the source of truth for your blog post. It sort of pays a little homage to cryptography and some old school kind of neat things. But I haven't had time to build this plugin. So for everyone else that's out there, feel free to take this idea and, and run with it. Uh, yeah, right. I, I think, uh, what is it? It's, 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 it's for, for five seconds, it's available. It's gone now. It's done. Um, 
But that's one of the things that attracted me to WordPress is uh, the lexicon of historical references. Because uh, they kind of they pick at you and you go, that's neat. What does Codex actually mean? <laughs> what is Mercurial? What are other what are Mercantile? What are, what are, I, I know the word, but what's the history? And, uh, and so Tiny MCE and Gutenberg, as you have said, are your sort of white whale. And we've talked about it on the, ta on the Tavern, on the WordPress Weekly. But uh, I've, in as long as I've known you, I've never seen you smile the way that I asked you, how is Gutenberg turning out? Because the visual editor has always been the thing that you like, but know could be better. Uh, and so, uh, tell everyone a little bit about like why you want Gutenberg to be what it is. Yeah, and who was in uh, Matt Cromwell's presentation earlier? Okay, cool. You all both got seats early, and <laughs> and probably have a pretty. Excellent idea of what Gutenberg is. Uh, I like that we did the back-to-back -back mats. Seemed like a good way to stack it. Um, I think that the web, what we're able to build on the web has evolved so beautifully. And the web has kind of turned into its own medium. Like, where, like what makes a great web post is entirely different from what would be a good magazine page or a good word document or anything else and so it's become this own uh, kind of uh canvas my, my colleague john Maida talks beautifully about how there's different types of design and distinguishes classical design from computational design so all of the editors that most cmss have used in the past were kind of more in like this classical print design modality where they really you had this, you almost were writing in a box that sort of felt like a page. They were all very derivative of like the, you know, Microsoft Word, to be honest. Um, who's ever done that thing where you like try to rearrange or change the alignment of an image or move it around in the post and then like you just lose <laughs> your whole life? <laughs> okay, okay. Who has ever, including in WordPress today, in the past, when did, uh, well, you should know, when did TinyMC come in? Was it 1.5, which was 2005? So in the past 13 years, who's ever switched to code mode because the WYSIWYG messed something up, right? And then you fix it. But I mean, we are incredibly privileged and lucky to be able to switch to code mode and come back out alive, <laughs> <laughs> you know? You are, you are very much in the 0.1% of the hopefully 8 billion people that'll be online in 10 years. Because you know that, you understand that code. Um, with Gutenberg, we want to give the flexibility of what many people in this room can create through understanding code. We want to give that power and freedom to everyone, uh, to the next you know, hundreds of millions of people who come online and graduate to publishing with WordPress. Uh, and I want them to be able to create those pages, those stories uh, that are so compelling because they're not just text and images, um, properly aligned images, of course. <laughs> you can have videos, you can have parallax, you can have audio, you can have contact forms, you can have interactive elements. You can have a blog that only exists in the world for your site, uh, but you use it at the end of, you know, maybe you ask a question at the end of every post and people do a little poll. Like there's so much interactivity. And that's what makes the web beautiful is it's two way. You know, it's what people missed about like the idea of interactive TV. People imagine that once we had this IP delivery networks to every home, that it would be more of like a one-way medium, that it would kind of look like uh, how the dominant media platforms at the time. Just like when they first started making movies, like the very first moving pictures were just videos of plays that people were putting on, you know? We think that the, the new medium is going to follow the old one very closely. And, you know, WordPress and many others have shown that that's not the case. And with Gutenberg, I want to build the foundation that for the next 15 years of WordPress, we'll be able to build on. And that's what's beautiful about blocks is they, they're starting, as Matt said, it starts with just the editor, starts with just kind of editing things, it's replacing TinyMC in that edit screen. Uh, but it moves to replacing every single other part of what you publish online. And now there's just one concept, which is a block. And as a developer, something you can write once, which is a block, and people can put it in their footers, they can put it in their posts, they can put it on their pages, 
uh, as we do more multimodal publishing in the, in the future. Like that block can transform to something for email or for mobile or for AMP or for like all the other places that your content management system, namely WordPress, can publish to. And maybe in the future, those blocks are viewed via VR. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much, yeah. <laughs> there's so much that, um, that this kind of enables us by, it's so rare in software development that you can both make something way simpler. We're gonna be able to take about like a dozen different concepts in WordPress, including menus, widgets, et cetera, short codes, and kind of simplify them down to this one thing, a block. Uh, but also make it much more powerful. And so we're able to do both at the same time. This is kind of a once in a generation opportunity for WordPress. And to the extent which we execute on it well or not, I think determines you know, whether there's gonna be a WordCamp marry me 20. So no pressure. <laughs> so I think we have 10 minutes left. Um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've always admired because I have a hard time really truly imagining the uh, enormity of it is uh, the, the juggling of the .org side and the .com side, sort of the spiritual leadership of uh, democratizing publishing and the open source project and uh, what, I, what I think really is sort of the, the generosity of letting other people kind of roll with it to implement their vision and their ideas because there are lots of things that are in WordPress that don't necessarily directly impact democratizing publishing. Multi-site. I mean, sure, multiple sites helps that, but it's not a thing that directly does that. Or comments are not necessarily a thing that help democratize publishing, but it is important that there's interaction and that there's dialogue. And so the customizer being able to make it look beautiful and pretty the way that you want to customize it is useful, but it doesn't necessarily help people hit publish and you know spread what they're what they're thinking or talking about. I t and I know that you do, which is good. But th there's that side of it where uh, there are pieces of it that are not a hundred percent a part of it, and that we have a community that gets to decide together what we think that vision is, and you do sort of let people roll with it even if it's not 100% right, or you're not 100% sold. A REST API is a good example of that. But on the flip side of it, then you're sort of the, the top of the dot-com and automatic and the, the money-making side of it, too. And so aside from the community pressure of uh, leading a project in the right direction is the economic pressure of, I mean, 50,000 jobs, I guess, at Automatic now? How many employees does Automatic have? 700? 700,000? No? Um, and so I'm curious if this was your vision 15 years ago, and now that this is where you're at, what does your day look like living it on both sides? How do you balance it, the, the Jekyll and the Hyde of it, or the yin and the yang of it, or the ups and the downs of it? Uh, what does that look like? Sure. Um... There's a lot embedded in that series of questions slash... Uh, I'm a co-host at a talk show. I've got lots of questions. <laughs> I guess a good way to start is, like, you dance with the one that brought you. I started with WordPress. Um, the WordPress core hat that I wear is the first hat I wear. So if there's ever something... If there if this has actually never happened, but if there was something that it's like, it's going to be this or that, I'll go with the WordPress way. Uh, part of why that doesn't really come up is because I truly believe that long term, these are completely aligned. And kind of the experiment with setting things up this way was a kind of nonprofit on its own can do so much, a for profit owns can do so much. But I was really curious to experiment that if we got this kind of working like a flywheel, where a nonprofit and for profit were working together, what could happen and what could be created? And it turns out that what can be created actually dwarfs what any of the approaches of either or without the other has been. Um, the size of WordPress market share dwarfs even the incredibly successful public companies like Shopify and Wix. You know, we have 20 or 30x the number of sites in the top 10 million running WordPress versus these other things, even though they make, you know, Shopify is right now billion, valued at $12 billion. Um, 
I think that most of the trouble in capitalism actually comes from short-term versus long-term thinking. And that particularly the public markets have incentives around quarter-to-quarter -quarter results, what's going on in the economy, what, like lots of things that don't actually have to do with the long-term viability and value of the business that's being created is going to happen. Uh, that's why I'm curious about things like the long-term stock exchange. It's a new project uh, to perhaps create a separate exchange, separate from NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange that can perhaps have long-term incentives and uh, basically incentive structures and ownership structures that encourage long-term shareholders. And um, for Automatic, we only have these long-term shareholders right now. We're a private company, and so our investors, we can kind of pick and choose who they are, and we only pick and choose the ones that uh, are in it for the long run. Some of our investors invested out of a 2002 fund, so it's been now 16 years. So you can find this kind of what's called evergreen capital that can really think long-term like you. But the, at the end of the day, like, there's lots of conspiracy theories and everything around automatic and everything else. I mean, automatic only makes maybe 3 or 4% of the money in the WordPress ecosystem. So for every dollar we make, there's about $25 made by other companies in the space. And if you actually look at the history of many successful platforms over the years, that's very consistent. And it's actually something we explicitly target. <laughs> so I believe that that's actually very, very healthy, that for every dollar any one of the companies is making, uh, there's a lot being made outside of that. Uh, why I emphasize things like Five for the Future and others is that right now we're in a little bit of a period where there's some companies coming in very aggressively, and so gathering a lot of the wallet share. So they're making a lot of money, but they're not really necessarily putting anything back into the core developments. And so that, uh, that has kind of a double whammy. The core starts to suffer, and then the companies that are contributing a lot back are essentially being outcompeted and put out of business. And so that can create a downward spiral. Uh, so, but luckily, the vast majority of folks in the WordPress ecosystem really understand that it's not just, not just software. Um, it's a community. And it's something that you have to garden and grow and invest in for it to continue. The success, future success of WordPress is not guaranteed. It's going to be the result of a ton of hard work from like, folks in this room. Uh, it's going to be a lot of discussions online. It's going to be a lot of disagreements, but ultimately deciding that if we do this together, it's going to be a lot better than if we do it separately or on our own. And uh, if there's anything that I would hope to be the legacy of Automatic, it's setting an example for how to build a business that can both do well as a business, but also create something far, far larger as a movement and contribute to something bigger than itself, bigger than any of the paychecks that any of the folks who work for Automatic get. Um, that is this thing that hopefully puts a dent in the universe a little bit uh, that we call WordPress. And I plan to keep working on that the rest of my life, <laughs> as long as y'all will have me. Um, I plan to stick around. And I feel incredibly lucky to have found something that can be my life's work from a young age, when I was 19. Um, so that, that experience, um, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, well, aren't you tired of WordPress? <laughs> but I come to some place like this, and I see this sea of beautiful, intelligent, like, excited faces. And I walk through the sponsor area, and you see all the different companies, and I go to the talks and hear how people are talking about things and learning, and you see people trying stuff I never would have imagined. And honestly, you can't not go to a, you can't go to a work camp and come out uninspired. <laughs> you know? You met someone, you made a friend, you learned something, you heard about something. Even if it's as simple, you know, one of the talks I was in earlier talked about they saw this presentation, and there was like a WPCLI command that like changed your life, you know? <laughs> Maybe it's that one line that you're going to put on the command line, or maybe it's a concept, or maybe it's an idea, or, you know, everything that we talked about the beginnings a little bit earlier, this all starts small. So the germ of something that you are going to hear this weekend could be the thing that becomes your life's work that you're working on in 15 years. Like, I'm working on something 15 years from 2003. So keep that in mind as you go through it, and uh, keep coming to work camps. <laughs> Right on time. Just like Gutenberg. Just like Gutenberg. <laughs> awesome. David, thank you. Yeah. Actually, I could sit up, so if you want to take another five minutes. Oh. Oh.
So, do, yeah. Uh, we can take some audience questions. I would prefer to not go running up and down the stairs just because it's hot in Miami and I don't want to, yeah. So if we can ask, shout a question and then I'll repeat it for the live stream. You're going to hurt yourself. Yeah, we'll just repeat it. <laughs> Any question? Oh, right here in the front is easy. The question is, there's been talks of a team at Google that will be working with WordPress, and they put out, actually, Google is hiring WordPress people, so they're hiring for a WordPress role, and what's, what's going on there? Is that the question? No, that, that is not a rumor. It's true. Google is hiring people to contribute just to WordPress. So uh, they're, they're doing better than some of those WordPress companies. Like they, the cool thing is that we make the web, they index the web. <laughs> it's a very complementary uh, relationship. And as WordPress has grown to comprise more and more of all of the websites that matter to Google, and something I hear from there is particularly in uh, certain countries, because WordPress is localized, and to languages, and so it has a very good, in some countries, in some languages, uh, which aren't, say, very commercially interesting to like the likes of like Facebook or someone else, WordPress actually comprises like a large, maybe even majority of all the web content published in that language. So uh, Google is really good at internationalization. They're really good at speed. They're really good at a lot of these things. And, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to deepen our relationship with uh, them. That, uh, I mean, WordPress has always been great with SEO and web standards and all that sort of jazz. But to actually have them involved in saying, how do we make every single site faster? How do we run tests against every single theme in the WordPress directory and show how fast they are as something next to their ratings? Like that's a lot of what the initial work will do. And you might have heard me talk about the Tide project at the, um, at the State of the Word. And uh, I almost said Philadelphia, in Nashville in the previous year. That's what that is. So Tide is basically a project that's going to say, take every plugin, every theme, and essentially run it through a, a suite of tests, uh, some of which will be organized around performance. And then we'll be able to show that impact, uh, because there's tons of data that shows that, particularly on a mobile device, um, who loves waiting like 10 or 15 seconds to load a web page when you click on it? <laughs> we got one. Uh, the slow web movement. It's like the slow food movement. It's a new thing. Um, ooh. So that is typically, you know, we need to get that under three or four seconds for it to matter and for it to be competitive with kind of the app experiences. And um, we're working together to do that. So I'm very excited about it. Cool. <laughs> Sure. So the question was, like, we talked about blockchain and, and uh, JTRIP's uh, watermarking plugin. Like, it's automatic thinking about any of that. Um, now, I'm not here to pronounce our ICO <laughs> or anything. Um, but, I, you know, we were one of the first large websites to accept Bitcoin for payments. So there's a, edited by uh, the founder of Ethereum, whose name I always mess up, I used to edit the Bitcoin magazine, and there's a big, there's a 2012 or 2013 issue with like the WordPress logo on it, which is really cool. So this is something that I think, you know, people forget, but all of these cryptocurrencies, not all of them, but basically all the ones that matter are all open source. And so it's very, very cool to see like open source start to be paired with business models and maybe bootstrapping like the future singularity AI <laughs> all in one. Um, and, uh, you know, many people at Automatic, including myself, have been following this since the early days and keep a close eye on it. Um, but thus far, as you probably noticed, like a lot of these, well, a lot of these things are being investigated by the SEC now. <laughs> we we uh, have waited and will continue to wait um, until there's like a really, really clear need or something that actually enables in a very user-friendly and consumer-friendly way something that was impossible to do before. Um, that's where I think that it becomes ultra interesting, and perhaps that bootstraps kind of the next phase of the internet. So, all right, Maroon, you closed it last time. You can close it this time.
Okay, so there are two questions in there. The first, or the second, was like, is Gutenberg doing any integration with like image sources, like Unsplash or others, so you can like bring images really easily into uh, your Gutenberg post? Um, I don't know if that's in Gutenberg core. I don't think it is. Uh, Calypso, which is a different project that Automatic makes, has started to integrate a lot of those free image sources. And um, so we are starting to integrate some of those through that. So perhaps that could be something that we enable through a plugin for Gutenberg in the future. Because I agree that just being able to type in like, uh, you know, dogs and getting awesome pictures of dogs, it's really cool to have. Another cool feature on Calypso is the, um, that which you can use on WordPress.com through Jetpack or WordPress.com site, is the Google Photos integration. I'm really excited about this. So does anyone use Google Photos? I, I'd recommend checking it out. It's actually really, really good. It puts in all your photos into the Google Cloud, and then actually analyzes them all. So you can actually search your own photos for dog, and it'll look through all of your pictures, and it actually finds, like, there's a painting of a dog <laughs> in my mom's house. It finds that, <laughs> as well as, like, the actual dogs and everything else, identifies faces. So there's an integration where you can just click log in with Google, and then within your media library, all of your Google photos are instantly there. And so you can click and then just bring them over. So that's in Calypso and Jetpack. So you can run it on any of your sites in Jetpack. Um, to the first question, which is advanced custom fields, um, the ACF is adding support for Gutenberg. I don't know if I can speak to more of whether that's going to be editable in the front end or not. Um, but the idea with Gutenberg is to basically decrease the distance between what you see on the front end and the back end while still having a really rich interface for being able to edit it. So when you see some of these pure front end approaches, uh, one, they can often be like, just like a pure WYSIWYG moving images around can sometimes get like, you get stuck in a little bit. And two, they're often don't exist on mobile. And we think mobile is gonna be a really, really important part of that next 15 years. So that's why we took the slightly separate approach that we did. But I, I'm pretty excited about it becoming a lot more of creating tighter conceptual links between what's on the front end and the back end. Cool, and thank you all so much for this exciting day. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, John.